Hello, my name is Robin Mitchell and welcome to this episode for Electromaker. In this video, we're going to be looking at the different types of microcontrollers that are available to you for your projects and which one you might want to use. Now, when looking at different microcontrollers, it can be quite unfair to simply say one's better than the other because there are so many different kinds and they're good for different applications. And that's why choosing the right one is absolutely essential. Now, before we continue, we should just quickly describe the difference between microcontrollers and microcontroller boards. So when you look at something like an Arduino Uno, or maybe something like, oh, I don't know, an NRF5340 Bluetooth development board, they technically are microcontrollers, or at least the thing that powers them is a microcontroller, but the thing itself is actually a board. And so you might find that there are multiple boards all using the same microcontroller. For example, off the top of my head, the, uh, there's the Adafruit uh, Featherwing, I think it uses an ESP32, and that might also be used by something like the ESP32 WROM or something, where you have the, uh, the dev kits and stuff. The point is, they use the same microcontroller. So they would, in theory, have the same performance, the only difference being I.O. and the board layout. And, ugh, <laughs> and the board layout. Damn it. <laughs> so the only difference between these two boards would be something like the board layout or the I.O. available to the user. So in this video, we're going to be looking at the most common microcontrollers that you might want to use in your projects. And these are the PIC range of microcontrollers from PIC 16 to PIC 18. We also have the AVR range of microcontrollers. These are very commonly found in the Arduino range of products. We have the STM8 range, the STM32 range, and an upcoming favorite, the RP2040. So let's start with what I would say is the most classic microcontroller for the maker. And it is the pick range of microcontrollers from Microchip. Now, these microcontrollers have been around for decades now, and I think they started on the PIC12 range. I can't quite remember off the top of my head but these things have been going since the 90s. And they, I would say, sort of set the standard for what microcontrollers should be. There were other competitors, and in fact, microcontrollers go further back than microchip. But I would say that microchip really sort of made the industry standard type of microcontroller, the one that you would want to use in most of your projects. Now, the thing about PICs before PIC 24, I think, is that they use a very basic architecture. Uh, the instruction set's very limited, and they tend to have limited memory, limited CPU capabilities, but this comes with a major advantage, and disadvantage is the fact that they are extremely cheap, very easy to use, very easy to program. And in actual fact, one of the strong points of microchip products is the fact that they have their own IDE that's dedicated to their products. So you don't have to try and use command lines or some kind of strange ID that's not related to the product to make it work. You basically just download the software from Microchip, you use the libraries from Microchip with a programmer from Microchip and it all works together. So it's very easy to use. So while the PIC 16 and 18 devices are quite slow compared to other microcontrollers that you can now purchase, and as we said before, their memory is rather limited, they also have some pretty weird problems when it comes to registers. Now, you only have to deal with this when you're coding an assembler. So you might have some of your registers in one bank, but then you want to access another register in another bank and you have to start bank switching. And this is extremely difficult. And anybody who's ever programmed a PIC knows the frustration when you're trying to mess around with the BSR registers and you're thinking, why is my variable not working? Oh, I didn't set the BSR register. And you think this is just, ugh. But, the saving grace is that of all the microcontrollers that I've ever programmed in Assembler, it was actually the easiest and quickest. You have direct access to all the registers. Um, the data sheets are incredibly helpful with microchip products. Their registers are clearly defined in clearly defined addresses. And generally speaking, I tend to get them working first time. Of course, as life moves on, we move away from Assembler. So really we're looking at things like C and C++ now. But for those who want to do some core, bare metal programming, especially for those who want to do video work, like for example, build their own TV controller to, I don't know, display text on a TV. The PIC is extremely good at that sort of thing. And this is where we now come to the strongest area of microchip controllers, their peripherals. Their peripherals are absolutely phenomenal. You can have almost any peripheral you can think of and you'll find it in a microchip controller somewhere. You know, you can have Ethernet, CAN, SPI, I2C, I2S, U different types of UART, USART, where you have synchronous transmission. Uh, I've seen parallel ports. I have seen 
Um, I've even seen parallel ports where they have interrupts and external read-write control. So devices external to the microchip to the microchip can actually put data into it without needing the microchip to do anything. And that's particularly important if you're building bus-oriented designs where you might have a common bus which transfers data between different microcontrollers. So now we get to the point of this chapter, which is what are PIC microcontrollers good at? They're low cost, so they're excellent for production line products. They are excellent in the area of peripherals. So if you've got a lot of peripherals going on and you want to remove the CPU from using those peripherals, you know, from doing bit banging and that kind of stuff, then microchip is phenomenal for that. Uh, and they're also extremely good on their software side. But there is a downside to the software, which is that microchip have paid for compilers so you can get a free compiler with, with all their devices but they tend to have some kind of limitation so unless you're looking to use the absolute full maximum of a microcontroller designed by a microchip uh, with efficiencies and optimizations then that's when you have to shell money out but they do have a free IDE they do have free software and they do have free compilers and now we move on to the next one the AVR microcontroller now again like the pick these have been around for donkey's years and they have been the bread and butter for many makers just like PIC microcontrollers, they come in DIP packages, so they're nice and uh, maker-friendly. They have free software. Again, that's extremely useful. And I do believe they have better free software than microchip without limitations, because I think they use the GCC compiler. Don't quote me on that, but I think that's what it is, and that's why a lot of people tend to use it as well. One of the interesting things about the AVR range of microcontrollers is that they tend to operate about four times as slow compared to PIC microcontrollers, but they can do operations on single clock cycles where PIC microcontrollers can't, as they usually require at least four. So in terms of performance, they tend to be about the same in terms of processing. But what's interesting is that AVR microcontrollers, if you can get them to a higher base frequency than say the equivalent PIC microcontroller, you can actually get them running faster. And AVR microcontrollers also don't have things like bank switching in their registers. So you're not having to do this really awful thing of trying to figure out where your registers are stored in memory and switching over to different banks to access them. And that's one of those things that makes AVR assembler programming superior to PIC microcontrollers. And of course, one of the biggest advantages of the AVR range of microcontrollers is that they support the Arduino IDE through a bootloader which you can load onto them. And this is absolutely crucial because it gives you access to the Arduino IDE, which then gives you access to an ungodly amount of libraries which are all available online, mostly for free. Servos, complex string functions, I'm just thinking of uh, classes. Hell, you can do C++ on those things. So you can actually, you can actually do class uh, object-oriented programming, which you can't do on a PIC microcontroller. You have access to things like all kinds of Arduino shields, Arduino designs, open source hardware. It, it is ridiculous. So you might look at a PIC and go, well, the peripherals are great on it. It's lower cost or something. But then you go, well, if I go AVR, I get access to everything that's online. And that makes coding extremely simple. Even though I'm a hardcore PIC microcontroller uh, user, I have many times gone over to an, uh, an Arduino based microcontroller like the AVR because of the huge amount of software support. Good example, I needed to uh, build a server, uh, I needed to control server on a recent project. And I originally did it in Arduino and it worked perfectly every time. And then I decided to switch, switch over to a, to a PIC because I have so many of them. And what happened essentially was I had to re or program my own servo function, which involved me messing around with timers, trying to get it right. And I have got it working, but it's a little glitchy. And I think it might be to do with things like uh, the, the, the lack of a crystal. So I think my timings um, oscillate a lot. And what that means is the server gets confused. But the point is on an Arduino, it's flawless. You, you, you program it and it's done. And pick microcontroller, you've got to handle it yourself, unless you're lucky enough that someone's made a library out there for you. So where would you use the AVR microcontroller range? Well, I can think of quite a few examples. Anywhere where you're gonna be involved with complex programming, that's gonna be very nasty to do in C. For example, string functions. Strings are horrid in C, but you use the Arduino IDE and you've got, you've got access to not only object-oriented programming, you've got access to things like strings. You've got access to things like index of, and it just makes decoding strings extremely easy. So anything that involves a message-based protocol heavily benefits from using an AVR microcontroller. So now let's move on to the STM8 range of microcontrollers. Just like the AVR range, they are fast. I believe they uh, have one MIPS per megahertz. So again, similar performance to the AVR. They are also 8-bit. They have really good program memory sizes and data memory sizes. But 
One feature that makes the STM8 particularly lovely and also applies to the STM32 range is that a family of STM8 devices have identical register numbers for hardware peripherals. And this is really, really important. And this is one of the major drawbacks of the PIC 16 and PIC 18F range of microcontrollers. So imagine you've created a timer on a specific PIC microcontroller, say timer one or timer two. And God forbid you wrote this in assembler and you then wanna use a different PIC chip. You might have to change all your register definitions because it might be different. So for example, uh, PIC 18 F something might have, I don't know, the timer one register on an address of something like three FF. Then on a different PIC, it might be something like two FF. And that change means that code isn't particularly portable between different PIC families. The STM8 range, however, has ensured that all devices across all the ranges use the exact same addresses. So you can move to different devices without needing to change your code. Of course, you may need to add new parts of code if there's a new register that wasn't used in a previous uh, microcontroller, but you don't have to change code that currently stands. So for example, a timer one in an STM8 something will be exactly the same as a timer one in another STM8, but a different part of the family or whatever. The point is, when you make the transition, the code doesn't have to change. And that makes STM8 excellent for production use. The STM8 range are also ridiculously cheap and come in very, very small packages. While the PIC micro range of controls do, they tend to be more expensive and have less capability than their STM8 counterparts. But that's where the problems of the STM8 comes up because they don't come in dip packages like the PIC and the AVRs. So if you think you're gonna solder one onto a piece of strip board or put one on a breadboard, think again, you'll have to get a module uh, as a complete board or you'll have to solder it yourself on a PCB and then put headers on to then connect that to a PCB. No, breadboard. Now the STM32, I would say, has had one of the biggest impacts on the market for microcontrollers, especially in terms of fame. It is found just about everywhere these days. I mean, modern microcontrollers coming out are all looking at the STM32. And when you look into the STM32 and when you learn to program it, you can understand why. The first and the well, biggest advantage is a 32-bit microcontroller, which is four times the number of bits than a eight bits or a two times as a 16. Okay, let's be honest, the number of bits doesn't entirely matter in a microcontroller unless you're dealing with really big numbers. But what is important is that the bigger bit width allows for more program space, allows for more memory, and it keeps everything in one linear continu continuous li conti con hmm. But one of the major advantages of having 32 bits instead of 16 or eight is that all your memory can be in one linear space without the need for banking or switching or different buses. And this makes programming Trivial, absolutely trivial, especially when you're looking at memory because you can access all memory, flash and RAM in one memory space. So you don't have to have different registers trying to access different mem memory areas like PIC microcontrollers, which are horrible trying to read out of flash. So the STM32 range of microcontrollers can be programmed with the STM32 Cube IDE. And this is a beautiful piece of software because not only can you obviously write your programming code in that and launch the code from that IDE. It also has hardware libraries which allow you to select different peripherals, configure them without the need to use code or configuration bits. So this is one of those problems that you'll find when you're using PIC microcontrollers or AVRs. You have to know the registers which you want to work with. And from there, you have to program the individual bits in your code and then hope to God that you got the peripheral configuration correct. But in the STM32 range, all you need to do is go to the hardware libraries, choose the ones you want with tick boxes and all that kind of stuff. It's basically a GUI. You can assign the pins which they go to, and then you simply go done, and then you can interface them via the hardware libraries. And I, from my experience, it is extremely easy and quite frankly, brilliant. And I do believe that Microchip MP Lab X is doing something like that, but I haven't seen it yet with PIC 16s or PIC 18s, but that might be because they're basic. If you go into the PIC 32 range, like the STM32 range, trying to use hardware peripherals in assembler or basic C is not gonna work and you need assistance when using those peripherals because they are incredibly complex. And well, why wouldn't you want to use a peripheral library when it sorts everything else out for you and you're not banging your head trying to figure out why your peripheral's not working? 
but the popularity of the STM32 also sees it supported by the Arduino IDE, and that means once again you have access to all the online libraries available to Arduino controllers on an STM32, and that gives you extreme amounts of power considering the fact that you now have a 32-bit microcontroller platform with large amounts of memory, large amounts of program space, and RAM, and peripherals, all with the power of the Arduino libraries, which is essentially any module that's ever been made that you can think of now accessible on the STM32 range of devices. But the STM32 isn't all that hype for two reasons, and this is the first one's always really irritated me. The documentation to using the STM32 IDE and getting it to work, let's just say that it, mm, let's, let's be polite, let's be diplomatic. It's terrible, absolutely terrible. There was only one YouTube video series that I watched that was able to tell me how to actually get it to work. I couldn't figure out why it wasn't working. I couldn't figure out why my devices would program once and never again. And there was all kinds of configuration things you had to config, you had to sort of set before you could actually use it. And it was a blooming nightmare. But now that I have personally written my own tutorials on this um, product, it is so much easier to use. And once you know how to use it, it is fantastic. But then there's the second issue with the STM32, and it's the same problem that the STM8 suffers from. There are no maker-friendly packages, which means you have to use a module like an Adafruit Featherwing or something like that, anything that has an STM32 microcontroller. Oh, the blue pill, that's one. So you have to use one of those with a breadboard or a strip board if you want to put it into your projects. If you build your own PCB, you can get them soldered onto the PCB for you from the PCB supplier or solder it yourself, but it's an SEM, it's an SEM, it's an SND package, and that means it's gonna be tricky to solder, especially the ones like tight quad flat pack where the pin spit when the pin pitch is extremely small, usually I think between 1.25 millimeters, and that is not a nice thing to solder. So where would you use the STM32? Well, pretty much any project that requires a beefy computer, essentially, with access to peripherals uh, and potentially the Arduino library. And it's for, it's for this reason that the STM32 will probably replace most, my, or at least it will replace a large number of microcontrollers already on the market. When you start a new project, if you can easily integrate the STM32, it does beg the question, then why would you put a PIC8 or a PIC16 uh, I meant to say PIC18, sorry. Why would you put a PIC18 or a PIC16 or an AVR if the SCM32 cost is cheaper, has more pins, more GPIO, and can basically wipe the floor with them in terms of processing power? So maybe cost-sensitive devices or energy-sensitive devices might favor the others, but generally speaking, the STM32 is an absolute beast of a microcontroller. And now the last microcontroller, and this is the one that's got me the most excited, and ironically, I haven't actually used it yet. The RP2040. Now this is a microcontroller produced by Raspberry Pi. They released it later last year, I believe, and they released it in tandem with the Raspberry Pi Pico, which is based on the RP2040. Now this microcontroller is like the STM32 in that it uses an ARM core, and it's also 32 bits. But unlike the STM32 devices, this one has no internal program memory. Instead, it loads its program memory from an external flash chip internally to itself in its static RAM and then runs from there. Now, you might be thinking that makes the hardware more complex, and you would be right. You have to add possibly a USB port, some resistors, you're going to need to add the uh, memory and then wire it all up. And that does mean that the Raspberry Pi Pico, no, sorry, the Raspberry Pi 2040 is completely off limits to prototyping when it comes to putting it on a breadboard or strip board unless you have a carrier or a module board like the Raspberry Pi Pico. But don't let that dissuade you for one simple reason. The Raspberry Pi 2040, when plugged into a USB port in a computer, appears as a flash drive. And this is a newer feature that I'm starting to see with a lot of microcontrollers now, especially, um, what you call them? Oh, MicroPython, the CircuitPython and MicroPython. This idea of having a microcontroller plug into a computer and appear as a flash drive which you can then drag programs into is just quite frankly phenomenal absolutely brilliant for the for the past 20 20 years yeah 20 years 20 30 years we've been using programmers like the pit kit 3 or the pit kit 2 or whatever and or the um oh 
oh, what's the AVR one called? Can't remember. The point is, these things are annoying. You have to have special programming ports with a special device that will, you have to buy from the company or buy uh, a clone version, which may not quite work well, and you hope it connects. Sometimes it doesn't, and if it breaks, you have to buy a new one. But the idea of having a microcontroller directly communicate to a computer and be seen as a flash drive is brilliant. I would say it's a stroke of genius, and whoever came up with that was, a, was an absolute genius. So when you finish making your program, you can compile it, turn it into a hex file, plug it into USB, drag it across, and it's done. So of all the microcontrollers that we have discussed today, the question is, who wins? The answer, no one. So you might say, for example, that the RP2040 blows PIC microcontrollers out of the water on processing and memory, and yes, you would be right. But the moment a project requires any peripheral, such as USB, Ethernet, or CAN, then the PIC microcontroller might be the better choice. AVR microcontrollers might be very useful if you're building a project where you want to have access to the Arduino IDE. But then you may turn around and say, well, I might as well go for the STM32. But then you might find that the STM32 range of microcontrollers are only available in SMD packages, whereas the AVR give you DIP. And that is far more practical if you want to build this project on a breadboard. Now, you might be wondering at this point, what do I personally stock? Well, I am a creature of comfort and I have a thing for nostalgia. So basically I mostly stock pick 18s, but that's not because I think they're the best. That's because I know how to use them and I know how to use them extremely well compared to maybe something like an STM32. However, I am now exploring the use of STM32 in my own projects and I'm starting to have some interesting results from that. I'm also going to be expanding and exploring the RP2040 and I will definitely not be going into the AVR area because personally, I don't think I don't feel the need for it anymore considering the fact that I can get an STM32 or a PIC if I need something with peripherals or something with power. But my hopes are set on the RP2040. And that's because of the fact that there is just something beautiful about an extremely small QFN microcontroller that costs I think less than a dollar, which is USB capable and can program an external flash chip with your code via the USB port and be seen as a flash drive. And personally, I would love a future of being able to transfer program files to my microcontroller without the need for a programmer. I've already gone through maybe three PIC kits because sometimes if, I don't know, if a wire goes loose when you're designing a project, you might break your PIC kit three. But in this case, you'll, you might break your microcontroller board of your project, but, but you haven't broken a programmer, so you can still technically program new chips. Now, most of the parts that we discussed in this video can be bought on our online store, link in the description below. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.